Hello, and welcome to the American Floral Endowment's three-part webinar series for Thrips Research. Throughout this series, we will hear the latest findings from AFE's Thrips and Botrytis Research Fund. AFE is the national nonprofit organization that funds scientific research to identify and solve challenges within the floriculture industry. In 2021, AFE is celebrating 60 years of providing for the future of floral. In 2017, after listening to important industry feedback, AFE established a special research fund to aggressively address the control and management of thrips and botrytis. AFE's goal of reaching 1.5 million in pledges was met in 2019 with contributions from 24 industry leaders and organizations to support new and innovative research to address these challenges. With those funds, AFE has been able to support eight multi-year research projects to reduce losses and produce higher quality flowers and plants. The American Floral Endowment and all researchers would like to thank all of the organizations who have made contributions in support of this important initiative. Today's speaker is Dr. Rose Boutenhouse research scientist of biological control at the Vineland Research and Innovation Center. Um, last webinar, I talked a lot about um, like why are thrips such a pest and why are they so hard to control. Today, um, I would like to talk more uh, in a more positive way, I guess, about the opportunity for use of biological controls. So uh, I often hear the question, is it possible to manage thrips using biological control as the main component of your IPM strategy? And from where I am in Canada and my research and my knowledge, I would say yes. Growers in Canada have really fine-tuned biological control against thrips and they're successfully dealing with pesticide-resistant thrips. The next question is, can any of these strategies be used in other parts of the world. And especially, uh, I get the question through AFE, uh, can it be used in Colombia? Um, this presentation, I will try to discuss the similarities and the differences between the floriculture greenhouse sectors in these two countries. I'll uh, try to uh, also throw in a bit um, of knowledge for the US, uh, because you'll see there's uh, a lot of similarities between Canada and the US. And um, I'll talk about the tools that are available and how to take the first steps towards a biocontrol-based IPM strategy against thrips. So here's a visual summary of thrips IPM programs in Canadian floriculture greenhouses. And this example is for potted chrysanthemum, but the program is easily adjusted to other crops, vegetable uh, or floriculture crops or even sometimes uh, new crops like strawberries and stuff. It shows the tactics that were used from sticking of unwooded cuttings, kind of here on the left, to all the way um, to um, production, to uh, the sale of the final product. Um, at the unwooded cutting stage, um, I will talk about dipping. But also uh, there is a, a release of predatory mites in the Canadian system. When the plants come out of the misting house, they get a whole load of biocontrol agents, uh, including uh, some soil predators here. Um, we have Stratiolelops and Atida, also known as Hypoaspis and uh, Delosia. Um, and nematodes, sprenches, uh, releases of or applications of biopesticides as Bovaria, and again, uh, broadcast of predatory mites several times or weekly. When the plants get um, spaced, uh, put further apart, um, they receive uh, sachets of predatory mites, maybe some more applications of biopesticides and other predators like aureus come into play. And then finally, um, at the point uh, where it's uh, ready for sale, if there's still any uh, residual thrips populations, um, you can do a cleanup spray with uh, a pesticide. And because you haven't used pesticides uh, throughout the production cycle, this, uh, the likelihood that it will work and that the thrips are not resistant is very high. Also throughout the 
production cycle, you'll see uh, strategies like mass trapping with sticky cards or sticky tape is taking place. So that's the program as uh, it seems to work well for Canadian growers. Um, now, if you're in the US, you will have a lot of these biocontrol agents to your disposal. Uh, also have a lot more chemicals to your disposal. So um, I think one way or another, you will be able to make this work. Now, not all these products are available in Colombia. Um, there are a few biocontrol agents available. Um, Phytocellus persimilis and Neocellus californicus are both predators of spider mites. And they will not really contribute in any significant way to thrips control. On the other hand, uh, Bovaria bassiana is an entomopathogenic fungus that can play a very important role in thrips control. And everywhere where you saw that like green spray icon in the infographic, um, that's where uh, Canadian growers use Bovaria bassiana. Um, I think in Colombia, there's also mineral oil available. I mean, technically it's not a biopesticide, it's more like a reduced risk pesticide, but it's a very useful product to integrate with biocontrol. And I will talk more about it in the section on dipping. So with, if you start from unrooted cuttings, you will have the best success with your IPM program if you can start clean. And this counts for any, um, any crop. If you start clean or free of pests, uh, your IPM strategies will work better because uh, you don't have to play catch up. Uh, for crops started from cuttings, this can be achieved easily by dipping unrooted cuttings. And this was um, research sponsored by the AFV. Um, and uh, I'll talk a bit more about it. So for cutting dips, you take the cuttings out of the bag, as you can see here in the, in the pictures. You spread them uh, loosely in a perforated tray. Don't pack them too tightly because you want uh, the cuttings to get covered completely. So for this, they have to be able to float a bit. Um, you can cover this tray with a second, oh, that's not what I meant to do, with a second perforated tray uh, and then completely immerse the thing in the dip solution. For small quantities of cuttings or very tiny cuttings, some people prefer to use a columnar or a sieve and it will work uh, fine as well. The goal really is to get complete coverage of the cuttings. So in this research, the products we investigated as dips were biopesticides or reduced risk products such as oils and soap. And the reason why we chose these products is that they have less issues with pesticide resistance they also leave minimal residues and they're highly compatible with biocontrol agents. So after dipping, uh, the cuttings are stuck in a substrate uh, as usual and grown uh, again, uh, according to normal production uh, practices. So in this graph, um, you see uh, the main results of the research. I mean, we did many trials in the lab and also in commercial greenhouses, but here I'll only show you the result of a research greenhouse trial. So we tested different um, cutting dips, the effect of different cutting dips, uh, Bovaria bassiana or a mineral oil product, and uh, it's called landscape oil here. Um, and those are the solid lines in the graph. Uh, it, we, and we also combined dips with the release of predatory mites. And these treatments are the dotted lines. Uh, the graph shows the number of thrips per pot over time, right here on the x-axis, over the course of four weeks. And as you can see, the blue lines are the control treatments. And um, the populations went up really quickly, really fast. Even with biocontrol, so the predatory mites, the populations of thrips still uh, went up uh, in week four, pretty, pretty high. Um, in contrast, both dips, uh, the blue, uh, the sorry, the yellow and the red lines, decrease the number of thrips significantly. Uh, the yellow lines in the graph are on top of the red lines, actually, so that's why uh, the red line is a little bit harder to see. Um, 
And also the dotted lines, if you follow up the dip with biocontrol, uh, the number of thrips was the lowest. So the take home message of this um, trial is that cutting dips basically set the clock back on thrips populations and give time to biocontrol agents to start working. Now an added bonus uh, in this trial was that we saw that landscape oil also reduced spider mites. The cuttings were accidentally uh, came in also with spider mites. And we definitely saw that landscape oil both reduced thrips and spider mites. So that was an extra bonus. Now on to uh, entomopathogenic fungi. So Bovaria bassiana, we use it in the dip, but it's very good um, product for thrips control, both preventative or even curative. And you can replace several pesticide sprays with Bovaria sprays, actually. Um, you have to get the fungal spores in contact with the thrips. So good spray coverage is very important. Um, that means apply it in low volume, so that's basically a fine mist that reaches both the upper side and the underside of the foliage. And you have want to avoid runoff because when it drips on the soil, it doesn't do much for it thrips. Um, recent research at Vineland showed also that cold fogging of Bovaria is possible. And in cold fogging, the spores are not exposed to heat when the liquid is vaporized as opposed to uh, pulse fogging. So in cold fogging, uh, the spores are not heated up and the coverage of the foliage was excellent and gave very good um, control of thrips. Finally, there's some formulations of entomopathogenic fungi like Bovaria bassiana or Metaresium anisopliae, MET52, um, as a granular formulation. And you can apply this to the substrate where it will help control thrips that pupate in the substrate. So for a country like Colombia, that's all the commercially available products. So what about the rest of the stuff I showed in the infographic? Um, if you can't buy it, where would you get some of these? Well, there's many predators that actually naturally occur in the landscape and that are very similar or even the same to the biocontrol agents that are available in the US and Canada. Um, in Colombia, there's on Aureus insidiosus, which eats thrips, aphids, and some um, Lepidoptera as well. Um, there are native predatory mites that live on the foliage or in the substrate. And I'm not sure if rove beetles like Dolosia or Athida are in there, but I definitely know there is generalist predators like lacewings, uh, Chrysopa, uh, surfeit flies, and lady beetles. So if they occur naturally outside, the question is, how do you get them into the greenhouse to control thrips? Um, here you see a picture of me, and I'm looking for aureus in the vegetation around one of the greenhouses that I visited in Bogota, in Colombia. So at the time, this greenhouse um, had a strategy to control all the weeds around the greenhouse, to reduce the habitat for thrips so that they would have less thrips pressure from coming in from outside. And it makes a lot of sense. However, the flowers that I inspected still had a lot of thrips. And you can see them here on my hand, all these little dots where unfortunately were thrips. And I could not find any um, predators. Like if I would do this in Canada, I would often find uh, things like aureus. And I suspect that the chemicals that were applied around the greenhouse, the herbicides, uh, did kill or uh, repel the naturally occurring biological control agents. So that was an example where um, they could probably not count on predators coming in from outside. Um, if you are able to find native predators and collect them, there are relatively simple ways to mass rear them on the farm. And you can do this also with uh, some of the biocontrol agents that are commercially available if you want to rear them yourself. And here are two examples uh, from the literature. Um, these are the articles. If you uh, input them in Google Scholar, you will be able to uh, find the original article. Um, so aureus can actually be reared in uh, jars like this uh, using flower moth eggs or Ephestia eggs as food. 
um, which is, uh, again, you can uh, buy this uh, from uh, some of the supply companies and also pieces of plants as an overposition substrate. So that's all in this jar here. Um, for predatory mites, you can rear them in uh, these plastic boxes and their prey is uh, are these uh, storage mites. Um, both systems are relatively simple once you have the right organisms and they will heal, yield high numbers of predators. Um, there's also other rearing systems for other biocontrol agents. So if you want to know more about this, um, let me know and I can point you in the right direction. Lastly, if you can't rear them, you can attract and maintain populations of biocontrol agents on uh, habitat plants. And you may have heard about habitat plants from another researcher that's supported by the AFE, Dr. Margaret Skinner from the University of Vermont, and she has done a lot of work on this. Um, the Twitter post I'm um, displaying here uh, is from Ronald Valentin. Um, he, you can see all the banker plants here, um, all these different uh, plants here uh, are all banker plants uh, that are grown at a large American greenhouse, Metrolina. And these plants are colonized by different biocontrol agents. Uh, so either they're inoculated with the commercially available ones or they come in from outside. Um, there's mullen plants that are colonized by dicyphus, a predatory bug, a mirrored predatory bug. Uh, there's ornamental peppers, the purple plants um, that are a good bank of plants for aureus insidiosis. And the white plants are alyssum plants and aureus and surfeit flies love these uh, alyssum plants. So these plants basically become breeding factories of biocontrol agents. And um, when they are throughout your crop or when they're inside your greenhouse, um, the biocontrol agents will move into the crop to manage your pests there. So there's a lot of interest now also in doing research on what plants to grow in the landscape surrounding the greenhouse so that you attract and encourage the establishment of naturally occurring predators. And that will be very interesting research to follow and see uh, if it will contribute anything to biological control inside the greenhouse. Now, as you will hear in Jay-Z's presentation next week, um, there is still a big role for chemical control of thrips. Even uh, in Canada, uh, you saw that, that cleanup spray, uh, or if the biocontrol program gets off the rails, uh, chemical intervention is still necessary. However, if you mainly rely on biological control, this will allow you to reduce the number of applications and have higher chances uh, of the uh, thrips not being resistant. However, Balancing or using biocontrol and chemical control together, integrating the two, is not easy. Um, even if you stop spraying today, there are still many ways that pesticides can interfere with your biocontrol program. Uh, first, there's many pesticides that leave residues on the crop and on the greenhouse structure, and those can persist for a very long time and negatively affect your bios. Also, if you've been using broad spectrum pesticides, they may have been controlling pests you didn't even know you had or that previously did not cause any problems. Now, when you stop these sprays, um, these secondary pests may cause an outbreak. So that's something that can occur. But integration of biocontrol and pesticides is possible. So, uh, you have to uh, consider well which pesticide uh, you want to use. Um, and then it can reduce pest populations before releases of biocontrol agents um, so that they have a better chance of success. Or they can clean up the plants before they're sold, or they can be used as spot sprays to treat hot spots of pests without affecting the biocontrol program in the entire greenhouse. Now, a big help for um, choosing the right pesticide are these side effect databases that you can find on the websites of several biocontrol companies. Here, I um, took the Coppered Side Effects database, which is one of them. Um, 
And I put in some of the pesticides that are registered in Colombia because I did this talk um, also at the CIFLOR um, uh, conference. So that's why I took these as an example. But here are, are some of the pesticides that are available. And vertically, uh, you can see some of the main biocontrol agents that are um, available in Colombia. So the output is basically a table. Um, and you can see the cells are filled with um, a number, a color-coded number, uh, which is the effect of the pesticide on the biocontrol agents. And it come, goes from compatible to toxic, um, green to red. Uh, and also you see uh, these numbers here are the persistence of this effect uh, in weeks or days sometimes. Um, a common misconception is that you only have to check the compatibility of insecticides and acaricides. But some fungicides and other chemicals can also have devastating effects on biocontrol agents and disrupt your carefully prepared biocontrol program. So it is very important to check. Now we'll go through a, a few examples. So here's an example uh, in this column here. Uh, you can see uh, this pesticide causes less than 25% mortality in the selected biocontrol agents. And this is indicated by a green number one. Um, this product also has zero residual effect. So uh, that's very advantageous. Um, you have to note, how, however, for some biocontrol agents like Aureus, there's no data right here. So we don't know. You can't uh, assume that if it's good for one, that it's uh, okay for the other as well. Um, and uh, the other thing is also, uh, this table only gives you information on the direct mortality of the biocontrol agents, how many die. It is still possible that this pesticide affects the searching uh, and predation capacity of biocontrol agents. And we call that sublethal effects. So even if they do not die, the biocontrol agents, when they are used uh, uh, or when they come in contact with this pesticide, may not give you the level of biocontrol that you are expecting. But overall, green means compatible. Now, this example shows two pesticides that cause more than 75% mortality in the selected biocontrol agents. You can see here it's a red number four, and it means more than 75% mortality. These products will wipe out your biocontrol program. However, the first one here has a residual effect of only one week. And the residual of the second product stay toxic for eight to 12 weeks. So if you have to choose, if possible, you should choose the product with the shortest residual so that you can rebuild your biocontrol program right away as soon as possible. Now, these pesticides are considered not compatible. However, you can still use them, like I said, if the residual time is short, or if you use them as a spot spray, uh, just in certain areas, so um, that you don't spray the whole greenhouse and not wipe out your entire biocontrol program, or you can use them as an end of production cleanup spray because um, the plants will be sold and, um, the uh, the biocontrol program is, is done. Now, the final example is of a pesticide that is compatible or not, depending on how you apply it on the application method. Um, so here you see a lot of red and orange, uh, which means toxic. And here you see uh, quite a bit of green, which is nice. Uh, so that means compatible. Um, and it really is the sprays are toxic, right here. This is the spray, SP means spray, but the drenches are compatible with certain of the selected biocontrol agents, not all, because here you see aureus insidiosis uh, is still killed by this. And that's probably because aureus uh, sometimes um, punctures the plant a little bit to get some water from the plants. So that's how it may ingest some of this um, systemic insecticide. 
So that's it for integration of biocontrol and pesticides. Um, and we've talked about control agents, biocontrol um, for all this presentation, but integrated pest management is way more than that. And if you don't pay attention to the effect of the plants and the effect of the environment that you grow them in, you're setting up your biocontrol program for failure. And um, we talked a little bit about this in my last presentation. It's really the systems approach to THRIPS IPM that will make it all work. Uh, in the last few slides of this presentation, I will explain a few ways you can make your production system more resilient against pest-like THRIPS. The first of this, uh, these strategies is mass trapping. Uh, you saw it featured very prominently in our infographic on one of the first slides. Mass trapping is one way that you can remove a lot of thrips from the greenhouse. And these two graphs are research uh, done by Dr. Sarah Jendwisik. She's with the Ontario Ministry of Agriculture, Food and Rural Affairs. And she found that most yellow sticky cards or rolls catch more thrips than blue ones. I mean, you normally hear that uh, blue is more specific for thrips, um, which is still true, but yellow, uh, certain yellow cards, especially uh, the first bar you can see, capture way more thrips than the blue ones. And this depends on the company making the cards or the rolls, um, as the yellows and blues are slightly different use. So like I said, blue traps are considered more selective for thrips, but the advantage of yellow is really that you can monitor uh, thrips and other pests at the same time and see if there are any biocontrol agents flying around. Only if you start trapping a real high number of biocontrol agents, I would say uh, consider changing from yellow to blue because uh, then you start um, uh, removing too many biocontrol agents from your greenhouse. But a few here and there will just tell you that the biocontrol agents are there, uh, which is nice confirmation. So the traps should be placed just above the crop canopy um, and inside vented greenhouses, so where the ventilation comes from the side, you also should place a lot of traps close to the vents to trap the pests uh, that are coming in uh, just before they land on the crop. Um, we have ongoing research that's looking at the option to combine traps with thrips lures, such as the aggregation pheromone or methyl um, isonicotinate. And sometime, uh, some research shows that significantly more thrips uh, are trapped on traps with lures, and other studies show only a slight increase. So uh, there are other factors at work that we don't know exactly what they are. Uh, if you want to try lures, uh, it's probably best to do an experiment for yourself to see if lures will work in your greenhouse. And of course, uh, if they work or if they don't work, I would be uh, very interested to know about it. Another of these arrows in my systems approach graph um, talks about the plant. So um, consider what plants are you growing? Um, greenhouse crops have traditionally been bred for higher yields in vegetables or a nice appearance um, in ornamentals with little regard for susceptibility to pests and diseases. Now, the breeding industry is increasingly investing in the development of pest resistance. So the results are promising even in ornamentals, where thousands of species and cultivars are grown. For example, this graph uh, is research uh, from 2014, and these are all different chrysanthemum varieties. Uh, and uh, on the y-axis is how much thrips damage uh, they will show. So some of these varieties showed no thrips damage, uh, while the same exposure to thrips in other varieties showed really high. Um, thrips damage. So um, you would probably want to choose some of these plants and uh, maybe pass on some of these. And it was very promising in this research as well um, that there was um, cross resistance. So um, increased resistance to one pest resulted in enhanced resistance to another pest like um, leaf miners, 
or um, spider mites in this case. So um, that is a very promising, uh, especially because it is resistant against several pests. Um, and uh, I think um, hopefully we'll see more of this kind of research uh, for other crops as well, especially ornamentals. And now that we have better um, molecular technique, uh, like uh, breeding techniques, such as marker assisted breeding, this will make selection of specific resistant traits easier, faster, and cheaper. Now, this breeding is one thing that's like the genetic um, uh, resistance, but are there things that you can do to your plants that will make the plant less attractive um, to pests? And there are studies that suggest that feeding the plants with a lot of nitrogen makes them a better food source for pests like thrips. And traditionally, a lot of crops are over fertilized. So there is actually room for reduction uh, of fertilizer without effects on plant quality. So uh, sponsored by AFE again, uh, we are currently doing trials to see if we can use this as a component for an IPM program. And our hypothesis is that reducing fertilizer will slow down thrips population development. Um, and this is because uh, nitrogen is transformed into uh, proteins and amino acids, and that's uh, what thrips uh, need, just like we need um, um, nutritious food. Um, thrips as well thrive on um, plants with high nitrogen. So in our first trial, we saw that um, lowering inputs from 200 ppm of nitrogen to 50 ppm of nitrogen resulted in uh, quite almost half the populations of thrips, especially in, uh, you can see here, sorry, I should explain this graph. This is the number of thrips per pot uh, in week five, week seven, week 11, and week 14. And the different colors are the different uh, fertilizer regimes from 25 ppm of nitrogen to 300 ppm of nitrogen. So here in week 11, uh, week 11 and week seven, you can see that the lower nitrogen uh, feeds resulted in less thrips. Now this research is still in progress. Um, we repeated the trial several times and the results were all the time slightly different. So uh, we're not at the point yet that we can really formulate recommendations, but definitely there is a difference between low and high feed. Now we saw, and you can see in this picture here, that plant quality started to suffer below 100 ppm of nitrogen. So another part of the study uh, was to see if there was a role for things like biostimulants to improve quam, uh, plant quality at low fertilizer levels, that it could, the biostimulants could help the plant cope with low nitrogen levels. Uh, so that's still all ongoing. I just wanted to show you some preliminary results here. So wrapping it all up, Implementing a biocontrol program against thrips is not easy. Uh, if you're in Canada with all and the US with all the tools available um, or in another country where you may not have all these tools to your disposal, um, even in countries where all the biocontrol agents are commercially available, developing a reliable and cost-effective biocontrol program takes several years. So it is a process that takes a lot of patience, faith, and perseverance, and things will go wrong several times before they start going right. Um, so don't give up too easy. You are on the right way. Um, one of the biggest risks to biocontrol programs comes from pesticides. And choosing the wrong pesticide to address a problem can completely wipe out your biocontrol program. So uh, that's why I spent so many slides on explaining the side effects table so that you can uh, choose the right pesticide. However, when you succeed in biocontrol, um, setting up a biocontrol program that works for you, you will reap all the advantages 
um, which includes sustainability, worker health, safety, uh, better crop quality, and you will have a resilient system that can deal with resistant pests, which are uh, is basically um, the driver behind implementation uh, of biocontrol, especially against threats. Um, so with that, I come to the end of the biocontrol portion uh, and the, the systems approach portion of this presentation. Um, you can see here my email address. Uh, if you have any questions, um, don't hesitate to send me an email or uh, look me up um, on the Vineland uh, website. Additional findings from all of AFE's research can be found online at www.endowment.org. We hope that you enjoyed today's presentation. Research and research findings like those presented today are possible only through industry support and contributions. Thanks to generous donors, AFE can provide research solutions free to support a stronger industry. Consider making a tax-deductible contribution to support the future of the floral industry. Visit endowment.org today and check back often for new sessions and updates.